And welcome to this week's edition of the Pete Mazzetti Show. My guest tonight is Howard Schwartz from the Better Business Bureau. Howard, welcome. How are you? I'm very well, Pete. How are you? Good. Good to see you again. Same here. So last time we were together, we were talking about a gen just generally what the Better Business Bureau does. So we're going to start tonight with who is Howard Schwartz and what does he do for the Better Business Bureau? All right. Um, what do I do? I'm the executive communications director, okay. which essentially means I'm the face and voice, and I write news releases, mm -hmm. web content. And if there are calls that have to do with any sort of thing the media would be in, uh, interested in, right. I would take care of that. Um, my background is television, so I was an anchorman and correspondent for 15 years, uh, had my own company back in, in Canada. And when I came here, I used the same skills as I developed as a reporter, mm -hmm. but this time to give key messages and to act very much the same in the respect that I was a health reporter for a while. Okay. And I figured if I could give one tip to save one person from a health problem, mm -hmm. then it was worth it. And so it is working for Better Business Bureau. If I can give one piece of advice that will save one person money or the trouble of identity theft, then okay. it's worth it. Now, how long have you been with the Better Business Bureau? I joined in January of 2008, okay. and that was shortly after Better Business Bureau rebranded. And uh, what was nice about it is we had a new website, and mm -hmm. I was new on board, so okay. there was a lot to learn. But what's great about the organization is there's interaction with people one-to-one. -one. Right. Uh, I don't handle complaints myself, mm -hmm. but uh, the people I speak with will sometimes uh, send a call over to me from someone who wants to know if they're being scammed or not. Right. Um, and it's a, a very tight-knit organization. It's very, very well run. We have better business bureaus across the country. Nice. Certain states will have two or three. Right. But we cover all of Connecticut. Very nice. And that's essentially it. There you go. Now, Howard, last time we were together, we talked about chip cards and security of said chip card. I was wondering if maybe we can talk a little bit about that this evening. Sure. Chip cards. Yes. Um, there's a common belief that chip cards are safer in terms of protecting consumers. Right. And if you look at Canada and Europe, where they've had chip cards for several years, right. there was a marked decrease in the amount of fraud involving chip cards, in, involving credit cards. Right. The problem here is that we don't only have the chip, we also have that magnetic strip right. on the back of the credit card. Yep. Until those disappear, the chip cards will be just as easy to copy as existing credit cards right. without the chips. The reason those strip stripes are necessary now is because not everybody's using the exactly. proper the uh, scanners for those. Mm -hmm. And I think um, what uh, people should realize is, is first of all, the, the, it's not a question of protecting them. It's protecting the retailers from liability. Correct. And last October 1st is, was the deadline for retailers to embrace that new technology and implement yeah. it. Right. Well, when the holidays came around, a lot of the retailers weren't happy over the fact that uh, a chip card reader simply doesn't work as fast as the older generation. Mm -hmm. uh, and we understand that the credit card companies are coming up with faster ways of having it read the uh, chip on the card. Okay. Ideally, uh, when there is full compliance. Hopefully those uh, magnetic stripes will come off the back okay. and that will truly uh, protect us from having someone copy our cards. That being said, if yes. you are the victim of fraud, right. contact your bank as soon as possible yeah. and there's no reason that you should have to suffer for that. Exactly, exactly. Now, do, do, do you think sometime down the road the magnetic strips on the back of the card are going to disappear? I do believe that because that's, again, what, ha what was the model in Canada mm -hmm. and in Europe, and they're only there, once again, for the uh, stores that have not yet implemented them. Okay. What, what's also interesting, though, Pete, is mm -hmm. that in the areas where they've had chip protection for some time, there have been other levels of protection that have been introduced. So, for example, if you uh, have a meal in Europe or in Montreal or wherever, yep. they actually bring the point-of-sale terminal to your table, and you swipe your card yourself because they don't want someone else handling your credit card. Gotcha. Okay. So uh, it's possible. I was the victim of fraud. I got a call from my bank one day asking me if I'd spent $500 at a well-known bathroom outfitting uh, <laughs> yep. a chain. Another one if I'd spent $600 at Forever 21 <laughs> uh, in North Carolina, as it happens, and well, a little older than 21, and I right. said no. <laughs> and they said it doesn't fit your spending patterns. You've right. been the victim of fraud. And this is very important for folks to know, is that the bank never asked for personal information. Nope. All they said was, we think you're the victim of fraud. Do you remember approximately what your last couple of transactions were? 
cut up your car, come in and get a new one. Right. Because sometimes people will get phone calls from, uh, for example, Rachel, Rachel from Cardholder Services, yep. or people who are imposters uh, pretending they're from the bank or mm -hmm. a credit card company, and they want to supposedly verify your information. Right. And by the way, you'll be happy to know anyone who's been awakened by Rachel at three in the morning yes. is the Federal Trade Commission is very, uh, has been very uh, active, very aggressive in going after these robocalling uh, computer servers. Yeah. And they recently shut down a whole bunch of them. So hopefully Rachel, Excellent. Rachel will not. She's one of the most reviled people that I know and when we're <laughs> doing presentations. And, and I asked for a show of hands. Who here has had a call from Rachel? Well, the eyes roll and, and yeah, exactly. raise their hands. <laughs> now, Howard, let's talk a little bit about is someone tracking your reputation online? That's right. And you'll never know unless you go on and Google yourself. There are really two types of, of trashing that we see, the most common ones. Yep. And one would be uh, against a business. So we've seen situations where businesses have had uh, terrible reviews against them, some yep. of them from legitimately unhappy customers. Right. But the competition may leave a nasty review. Mm -hmm. uh, a disgruntled employee might leave a nasty review as well. And in fact, there are some restaurants and other retail outlets that have tried to force customers to sign an agreement that they will not post a negative review. And uh, the, sorry, First Amendment. People exactly. have the right to explain whether they're happy or not. But then when we're talking about face-to-face, -face, if someone's being trashed, we know it starts very young now with school kids, mm -hmm. uh, cyberbullying and whatnot, right. uh, with disastrous consequences sometimes. So uh, there are two other categories. Uh, one of them is trying to hurt people because of relationships. And there are sites where an ex-husband or an ex-wife will post inappropriate uh, photographs right. or say some really bad things about them. Um, and there are people who will simply uh, enjoy watching people's lives turn into train wrecks exactly. on social media. So I think the very first thing we have to do is find out what are people saying about us. And this is important for a couple of reasons because uh, if you're young, a young person, for example, and I think a lot of people don't understand if no. it's on the internet, it ain't going away. Right. And if you have photographs of yourself um, getting trashed every day or every weekend or uh, using drugs or right. inappropriate content, well, employers are now not only test, uh, checking just your resume, mm -hmm. and they're not just Googling you, they're also checking social media sites. Right. And if they see you uh, trashing a former employer or your current employer, they may be less inclined to want to hire you. Exactly. So there are a couple of things we can do, and the first of which is exactly. know what we're putting online. Right. And think about the potential consequences, mm -hmm. which is sometimes very difficult to do. Right. Um, the other one is don't ruin your own reputation with the kinds of things you post. It's very easy to do, it and is. we don't think ahead to the consequences. Don't fight in a public forum. And that applies to bloggers, because it's a wonderful thing to do. And people who start a blog find out very quickly that not everybody agrees with you. Right. And you'll have some folks who will come at you again and again on the same subject. So for example, if I'm moderating a blog, I will twice address whatever their complaint is. And if they just keep hacking away and criticizing, and, and it's not a constructive exchange, I'll just stop responding and let the other readers make their own decision as to whether or not the person uh, has any merits. Okay. And finally, seek legal advice. In some cases, you may have to do that if it's uh, trashing of the type that uh, is either threatening mm -hmm. or where it might result in some sort of financial or reputation damages. Um, some of these things can be taken down, by the way, okay. uh, depending on the situation. One of the problems, well, one of the good things actually is Google, for example, will take down a post in which somebody has put up someone else's social security number or credit card information really? or banking information, uh, those types of things. But as far as the rest of us are concerned, it's very difficult for the search engines to block all kinds of nasty things because these are, uh, the search engines pull their information from other websites. Right. And they may not be so happy about pulling down a post that they've got. Exactly. Now let's talk about being garage sales and yard sales as far as that goes. This is the time of year. Yes. Um, I love them. I drive around all the time to check them out. Exactly. But there are some things that we don't often think about when it comes to it um, because there's some things you should not be buying at a garage sale for safety reasons. Right. 
Um, let's start with motorcycle or bicycle helmets. Okay. You may not see that the thing's been dropped, uh, is damaged, or has been poorly repaired. Right. Not the kind of thing that you want uh, to wear no, yourself. of course not. Or have your child use. Right. Um, the same would apply to children's toys, mm -hmm. cribs, car seats. They may have been subject to a uh, recall of some sort. They may have been declared unsafe. These are the things we have to watch out for in terms of pure danger. In terms of what we should be watching out for ourselves, if you're going to buy something electronic, mm -hmm. test it out and know that there are risks associated. Right. Not necessarily that somebody would do so maliciously, but if it's a laptop that they bumped or dropped, right. it may work fine for them. But after a week, if you take it home and it stops working or the drive crashes, right. you're not going to be very happy. No. If you are a seller, mm -hmm. on the other side, a few things you want to do. Uh, I would say the first of which is get one of those uh, counterfeit money detection pens, which you see at the cash the register black. sometimes. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, try to avoid the larger bills, keep lots of change handy, and uh, if somebody's going to pay you by check, mm. you might want to ask for identification. Okay. So uh, enjoy yourself. The, the whole idea is to get rid of your stuff. Don't right. overprice it. Right. And in fact, you can even uh, create an incentive for people who come early. Uh, for the first hour, for example, if you go from 8 in the morning until 5 in the afternoon. Right. Now let's talk about avoiding s tips for avoiding fraud on summer getaways. Yeah, summer getaways, it's just uh, like the winter ones, we tend to let down our guard. Right. Why not? The sun's out. The beach exactly. is Exactly. The sun's out. We're going on the beach. But I think that we forget sometimes or would hope that because we're on vacation, so would the criminals be. Right. Uh, no, it's quite the opposite. And I think that we put a lot of emphasis on the high-tech aspects of identity theft and crime. All right. But we tend to overlook the fact that the vast majority of identity theft and other types of fraud mm -hmm. are uh, committed on a low-tech basis. Pickpockets, purse snatchers, right. the old one where somebody bumps into you and, and spills food or coffee on you, and while they're helping you clean up, they have someone come up behind you and they and take you valuable. Exactly. Um, other things we should be watching out for mm -hmm. is uh, ATMs. If you're going to use a, an ATM, yeah. rather than using a standalone, go to a bank. Right. Because sometimes people will put on what are called card skimmers. Mm -hmm. Same thing on gas pumps. Right. It'll be a, a cover, um, and you put your card in, and right. it'll actually read your information and transmit that to somebody who might be around the corner in another country. Uh, or even another continent. So when you're at an ATM, make sure that the uh, cover, the card reader, is flush with the machine, that everything looks right. right. Um, some criminals actually will put a small pinhole camera right on top of the pin pad so they can see what your pin number is and empty your bank account. And this also uh, underscores one of the reasons why you should always cover that pin pad. Um, be around of your, uh, aware of your surroundings, very, mm -hmm. very important. You're not at home. You right. don't necessarily know what the dangers are. Um, call not only your credit card company, but your bank as well, because uh -huh. um, I've, had, uh, I've had transactions rejected in neighboring states uh, on the way to mm -hmm. uh, one destination or another. It's your bank that tells your uh, credit card company to l loosen the security of it. Right. So tell them what your route's going to be, where your stopovers mm -hmm. will be, how long you'll be there, and when you're coming home. Okay. Um, this is an important one. When you're using free Wi-Fi yeah. in a hotel or coffee shop, and this is not just when you're away, ask them what is the name of their network. Right. So the reason is if you go into a coffee shop that says Joe's Coffee Shop Wi-Fi mm -hmm. and you connect on it, that's fine. But there may also be a network called Joe's Coffee Shop Wi-Fi 2. Right. or best coffee network. Right. What you may not know is that one of those networks is phony and it's coming off of somebody's it's taken, laptop. It's taking your information. Exactly. Taking so at the very least what you should be doing is not logging into any place because somebody might be watching exactly what you're doing. Exactly. Uh, certainly not any uh, sort of commerce. And uh, there are a couple of interesting uh, hotel scams that have developed in the past few years. Oh. One of them is called the front desk scam, and you generally will get a phone call anywhere between 11 at night and 6 in the morning at a time when you, you might have your guard down. Exactly. They'll say, uh, Mr. Mazzetti, there's a problem with our computers. We would like to verify your credit card information. Can you please give it to us? Mm, no. When in fact, no, that phone call is coming from outside of the hotel right. and someone's trying to scam you. In such a case, know that uh, the front desk will never call you and ask you for personal information. Right. If you have any uh, question in your, uh, whatsoever in your mind, go down and see them. Right. 
One of the new ones that I've heard about is called the flyer scam, the food flyer scam. And what happens, it, it sounds rather harmless, but uh, criminals will get into a hotel, they'll slip flyers for pizza under the door. Right. And you call up, the pizza looks great, they take your credit card and you wait and wait and wait. And no pizza shows up. Closest you're gonna get to that pizza is the photo that you've seen on the flyer. <laughs> so be careful and don't assume just because something looks, we know that in this age right. you can create a, a, a business card or a website and right. make it look like it's a million dollars and fool people have to really not, it doesn't take a lot of talent to do those kinds of things. Exactly. Howard Church, would you mind sticking around for another segment? Be my pleasure. We'll be right back. Thanks. Every day, the people in our community rally in support of United Way as we strive together to make a big impact to change lives in Middlesex County. From our main streets to our institutions, from our neighborhoods to our town halls and our classrooms, we're working with our partners to create a stronger community. It's an inspiring effort and we invite you to join us. Volunteer. Donate. Live United. Looking for Connecticut's best ride? You'll find it at the Closer to Free Ride. On September 10th, ride an inspiring 10, 25, 62.5, or 100 miles. Every dollar you raise supports research and care at Smilo Cancer Hospital at Yale New Haven. This is your ride. Register today at RideClosertoFree.org and help bring our world closer to free. Welcome back to this week's edition of the Pete Mazzetti Show. Sitting here with Howard Church from the Better Business Bureau. Howard, welcome back. Thanks, Pete. Thanks, Thanks buddy. Here. So we were talking a little bit about, in the first segment, the about, about buyer beware and scams and all that other good stuff. What, do we, what should we talk about during, what would you like to open this segment talking about? Well, something that's important because we're spending so much time on them, and that's mm -hmm. smart device vulnerabilities. Yes, okay. I don't know anyone, frankly, who, well, I know one or two who have, I, I called mine a cell phone because mm -hmm. it was a cell phone, one of those flip phones, and it was held together with scotch tape. Mm -hmm. But um, <laughs> they're ubiquitous. They're everywhere now, the, right. uh, the smart devices. And people tend to regard them as telephones with, uh, that can store information, when in fact these are computers that are able to make uh, telephone calls. Right. Some folks don't put passwords on them. Uh, that's danger number one. Uh, but the other thing we have to consider is that we've seen an awful lot of hacking going on and data breaches in large companies. What we should be aware of, and, and uh, it's easy to see why, is in the next few years, I believe our smart devices are going to be the primary target for criminals. Right. Um, the big money maker right now on the black market is not credit cards. A credit card can be obtained for $5 on the dark internet. Right. If you want personal information, you have to pay $50 or more for it. So if somebody is able to uh, get information from your smart device, mm -hmm. either by hacking back through your Wi-Fi or right. your wireless or whatever, they're gonna have a trove of information. And when we had, uh, when PCs and Macs were uh, all the rage, we didn't have smart devices, right. there were certain precautions we could take and we oh. took them very seriously. Uh, and I think what we've started to do now is think that we're invulnerable. Um, there have been some breaches, uh, Apple has had uh, problems with some of the apps. People have fooled them and managed to slip them in. And the same with Google. And I think the most important thing we can do is if you're going to get an app for an Apple device, you do so from their app store, mm -hmm. from Google, Google Play, and so on. Right. But let's remember that uh, we have to be very careful about this and we should be listening for any type of developments because, again, we're carrying around uh, a smartphone that may have credit card information in right. it, which we shouldn't be putting in there. Correct. But also personal information about ourselves. And um, you've heard the expression apple picking before. Mm -hmm. Somebody comes up, grabs your phone. The cell phone companies are getting better. Mm -hmm. um, now there are deterrents to people stealing them, but they're still worth an awful lot of money. And um, I think that that is a, uh, there is enough valuable information in this cell phone, aside from the smartphone, can go right. for several hundred dollars, mm -hmm. um, that we've got to really be careful with those and uh, remember that it's a potential target. Exactly. Now let's talk a little bit about the, how many Americans are the victims of the five top types of fraud? Well, this is interesting. This comes from, uh, uh, from a survey that right. was done by the Federal uh, Trade Commission, okay. 
and they looked at the top five of 17 types of fraud. And these were the ones that people complained about the most. And let's go through them. Sure. Now, this is from what is called the Federal Trade Commission's Consumer Confidence Study. Okay. And it looked back, it was a retrospective study that looked back at uh, fraud during 2011. Okay. And during the study period, the Federal Trade Commission estimated 11% of adults in this country, so we're talking about 25 and a half million people, lost money because of criminal activity mostly for goods and services. Right. So we talk about scams, this is exactly what we mean. And we've seen hundreds of scams over the last decade, ranging from fake lotteries to inheritances to uh, uh, relatives in distress, uh, the grandparent scheme as we call it, uh, IRS imposters, by the way, which is still the number one scam in Connecticut. Really? Um, that we should know about. People being uh, threatened by would-be uh, mm -hmm. internal revenue service people. And what we have to remember in that case is a government official, a bank, a doctor's office, again, will never call you and ask for no. personal information. And now in, in uh, election season, as it's heating up even more, mm -hmm. um, the do not call list has three types of exemptions. Yeah. And the reason we're going to talk about them is because one of the exemptions uh, is for public opinion pollsters, yep. the other is for charities, and then the third is for pol uh, political parties and politicians. Yep. What we have to watch out for um, is anybody who's asking for money, even though it may be a legitimate charity, even though it might be a legitimate political party, you won't know that because our caller ID is really not reliable now. That can be spoofed easily. If you want to give money to a political party or a candidate, go directly to them and do that. Correct. Same with a charity. Uh, and if someone calls you up asking to do a public opinion poll and uh, at the end they offer you some sort of a prize uh, or they try and sell you something yeah, no. in exchange for money, uh, the prize or whatever, don't go for mm -mm. it. So uh, I mention that again because these are frauds that, that are easy for people to overlook. Right. Now when we look at these top types of fraud, according to the FTC report, the number one uh, type of fraud that people are losing money uh, in, uh, in the United States, weight loss supplements. 5.1 million victims. Really? Um, it goes in the snake oil category. Okay. And if people are, uh, if uh, some of our viewers are too young to know, snake oil is uh, the sort of thing you'd sell at a carnival mm -hmm. and it would cure everything, but of course it would be bogus. Right, exactly. But there's a different, uh, uh, a worse problem than just having a supplement that doesn't do anything. Uh, the weight loss supplements may contain certain. Uh, certain ingredients that can interfere, uh, cause harm, or even uh, be fatal if they're mixed with medicines okay. that you're taking on a regular basis. And the Federal Trade Commission and the Food and Drug Administration are very clear about this, that there is no magic bullet. There are prescriptions you can get for certain types of weight loss programs, right. but you're not going to find it in a magazine or on a click ad on right. the side. Exactly. And we've seen situations where, uh, in fact, they use fake celebrity endorsements they use Photoshop to, to uh, fake the pictures, and they've even illegally used the logos of news organizations to lend legitimacy to the ads. Really? Free lunches, trips, and other prize promotions, 2.4 million victims in the United States. Okay. We don't like to get something for free, but right. if you get that postcard in the mail saying, uh, vacation for two for a week. All you have to do is attend a sales presentation. Mm -hmm. Well, what Better Business Bureau hears about across the country is people attend the sales presentation, that they have to fight to get any sort of so-called vacation, right. and they have to pay hundreds of dollars in fees. Mm -hmm. So there really is no, no free lunch. Exactly. Uh, next in the category is Buyer's Club memberships, 1.9 million Americans. Okay. Now, we're not talking about the big box stores, that type of a membership. Right. We're talking about people who will try and sell things like a, a travel discount club. They'll charge you a thousand bucks, maybe two two thousand dollars, and they say you're entitled to all types of discounts on travel, when in fact you're probably getting worse deals than you would if you looked them up yourself. Okay. Unauthorized billing for internet services, 1.9 million Americans. Really. Um, well, and what happens is, and this is an, another reason we should really be watching businesses and consumers, watching our credit card statements, utility bills very clearly, because people are billed or they'll find a charge on their credit card right. from a company that says it's providing internet access or it's hosting their website, when in fact they never asked a company to do that. It is right. pure and outright fraud. Then I would say let's uh, finish it off with work at home offers where we've got 1.8 
million Americans, this mm -hmm. is back in 2011, right. who were victims. Um, the salary is enticing, you don't need experience, you can make your own hours, those are typically the approaches that you hear. But some of the work at home scams involve uh, having to pay in advance for materials. Uh, sometimes it's uh, assembling things like arts and crafts. Well, you put the money out in advance, you send the crafts in and they'll say, nope, that's not, that's not good, redo it. Some of them will uh, say you can make great money stuffing envelopes or mm -hmm. medical billing. Well, medical billing requires expertise and it's not the kind of thing right. that will be advertised on the internet like that. Exactly. Now, Howard, let's talk a little bit about the dangers of lurking some social media habits. Yeah, one of the, you know, it's often the, that people are the authors of their own misfortune. Yep. We want to share, we want to click on everything, and unfortunately, social media, uh, the dark side comes out more and more as right. it develops. So if you go on, I'm not picking on Facebook, but right. Facebook is a good example. Right. Uh, you can play games, you might get a link to see some sensational video, right. and I'll give you an example. Uh, when Osama bin Laden, mm -hmm. uh, was uh, taken out by, by troops. Yeah. Uh, there were links on social media saying if you want to see some graphic photos, click on this link. Yes. One of two things will happen. Either it'll take you to a site where you will end up downloading malware into your computer, yeah. unknown to you, mm -hmm. um, or it'll take you to a site that asks for personal information. Uh, the other thing though is we should understand about social media is sometimes they just want you to click. And the reason is it's called click bait. There are people who get okay. a certain amount of money every time somebody clicks on the website. So you might think that you're clicking on a news article and in fact, it'll lead you to somewhere that you don't even want to go. Those are the ones that aren't too harmless. Right. But then you get things like IQ tests or various other things that you can be involved in where they may ask you for personal information. And I think at this point, in 2016, we can no longer afford to just give out information. Right. We should have a separate secondary email address for things mm -hmm. like these types yeah. of things. But also be aware that just because it's on a website does not mean it's legitimate, does not mean it's safe for us. Okay. So be very careful there and on any link that you're gonna click. It's very simple, you know, I would go as far as to say a, a, a primary school student would be able to put together a, pretty sophisticated page with fake hyperlinks in it. Really? Which is scary. It is scary. And before we say goodnight, your website, one more time, if people want more information on the Better Business Bureau, where can they go? It's bbb.org forward okay. slash Connecticut. Okay. And you can look up a business, a professional, or a charity to see what their, uh, uh, what their marketplace record is like and what other consumers have to say. Okay. Uh, or you can choose a Better Business Bureau accredited business from our accredited business directory. That's and if you are looking for a charity, please check first to make sure that the money gets to where it's supposed to. Howard Schwartz from the Better Business Bureau. Thanks for coming down. We'll have you on again soon. Will do. Thanks, All Pete. All right. On behalf of Howard Schwartz, I'm Pete Mazzetti. Thanks. Good night. And we'll see you next week.